I'm Leslie Bodowitz, the immediate past president of Sisters in Crime. As part of Sisters in Crime's 30th anniversary celebration, I'm here in Chicago at the offices of the American Library Association with Sarah Poretsky, our first president, and the woman we call our founding mother. Sarah, thanks so much for talking with me today. From your perspective, what was the impetus or the inciting incident, as we sometimes say in fiction, for forming Sisters in Crime? The inciting incident, I had never heard that phrase before. I keep realizing that I really am a Grandma Moses kind of writer, completely untrained. Someone just told me that books should either have a three arc or a four arc story, and I have no idea what that means. I never knew that I needed an inciting incident in my books, but in my life there have been plenty. So in March of 1986, B.J. Ron at Hunter College in New York convened what was really the first national conference on women in the mystery. And we were just starting to hear from a lot of different women, a lot of different voices in fiction generally and in the mystery in particular about ways that we felt that world was, was very much out of balance as far as women were concerned. One of the things that I took away from that meeting was a lot of anecdotal sort of heartfelt cries from women writers who were just being completely ignored by libraries, by bookstores, and really as we found when we started digging down and doing the work because they were being completely ignored in book reviews. And uh, Flo Kennedy one of the great civil rights and women's rights lawyers of the 60s and 70s had a little slogan which was, don't agonize, organize. So over the months after this March conference, as I kept hearing from women around the country, I thought either we need to organize or we need to just button our lips. So I sent out a letter to everyone that I had met to see if there really was enough interest in, in these questions to form an organization and really try to, to fight some of what we all felt were some serious imbalances, if not injustices. And um, my editor then at Ballantine, Marianne Eccles, very kindly agreed to underwrite the stale sweet rolls and overboiled coffee that we served at the Baltimore BoucherCon that, that October. So 26 women came. Somewhere there is the sign-up sheet that they all filled in. I think it's with the Sisters Archive. Is that in Rutgers or Boston? So the Sisters Archive in Rutgers. I turned all of my sister's documents over to them many years ago and don't have any of those files anymore. And I collected those names and addresses and, and wrote to everyone to see what people wanted to do next. And as a result of that, I created a questionnaire just asking what people felt their biggest needs were. And the two that I remember as coming to the top were a need for uh, sort of camaraderie so that each writer didn't feel completely alone, and also for uh, dealing with this terrible imbalance in, in book reviews. Dorothy Salisbury Davis, who was then one of the, the really prominent voices in MWA, Mystery Writers of America, and widely respected as both a writer and as an MWA board member, came to that first meeting and she really took it on herself to do outreach to MWA. She got Mary Higgins Clark, for instance, to sign up as an early member to give the, the group a certain amount of boost. Barbara Mertz, another very important and gifted writer, and both Barbara and Dorothy are sadly now dead, but uh, Barbara also came to that meeting. And I just don't remember, after all this time, who else was there. Nancy Picard, who played a significant role in it, came. And so I went back to Chicago with with these names and, as I said, then sent out a questionnaire and, and got back these results. And by, by May of 87, during Edgar Week, we had about 90 people who had 
come on board. And people who were really active in the in the earliest days who who sort of have disappeared from the record included Jane Langton from Boston. Kate Mattis, who owned Kate's Mystery Books, was a huge early supporter and really spread the word out through her network of, of customers and friends. And, um, and so that was, that was where it all started. So when we finally met in New York in May and you know, it's the little things that slow you down. Like, what were we going to call ourselves? I don't even remember what some of the of the suggestions were. Sisters in Crime just seemed so perfect. Someone had written a book with that title, and I remember Dorothy was concerned about whether we were stepping on legal or emotional toes by by using that that name. But we kind of overrode that. I guess. Um, we wanted to have what was really, in retrospect, in hindsight, impossible. We wanted a really democratic organization without hierarchy. And uh, originally, every decision we made, every one, and you know, we were rapidly adding members, so 90 in New York and in May and maybe 150 by the Boucher Con in October of 87. I th think that might have been in Minnesota. Yeah. Um, we wanted everyone to voice her opinion and vote and so on, and then it just became unwieldy. And it was one of, for me, it was one of the, it was a sadness that, that we ended up with even a steering committee and first, we were just going to call the president the chair of the steering committee and try to make it more egalitarian. We wanted to have, originally, those of us who originally convened it, Kate and, um, Kate and I primarily, um, we wanted representation from all aspects of the industry. So we were hoping to have programs that would be important for women editors as well as for writers, booksellers, and then we also wanted readers represented, people who weren't aspiring writers, but, but our readers. And so the first steering committee, there were, I guess, well, there was Nancy, me, Sue Dunlap. We wanted to make sure we had the regions of the country covered, and Sue stepped in from the West Coast. Um, Charlotte McLeod, and then Kate, who owned a bookstore, and Betty Francis was the reader, and she was quite a, a she had a, a sort of a powerful but very quiet voice, and was a was one of those discerning readers who brought a lot to the table. At the time that the organization was formed, what did you see as the biggest needs and challenges facing women crime writers? I think that women writers and women readers felt, looked at, at this baby organization as, as a tremendous validation for their experience. And one of the first things that we did uh, was, the, was the book review project. And I can't remember the timing on that, but we discovered along the way that Libraries, as everyone knows, are the are still today the main purchaser of new and midlist writers' works. Well, for all, everybody except for the people that really are at the top of the bestseller list. We all depend on libraries, and libraries make their buy decisions by two, sometimes three, juried uh, reviews in juried publications. So. We did this book review project where people just volunteered to, to clip from their local papers. And of course, back then, pre-internet, pre-conglomatization of the media, there were something like 200 uh, independent review outlets, and people clipped them and read them and tabulated them. And then Jim uh, Huang, who at that time was the editor of the Drood Review, came up for us with a list of every 
crime novel thriller, everything that fit into our genre that had been published in the same 12-month period that we were studying reviews. And what we found was that a book by a man was seven times more likely to be reviewed than a book by a woman. And so the whole, the whole kind of reason for why women were finding their careers short-circuiting was, was obvious in those data. So I don't know if it was at Minneapolis, but as we had all this energy, uh, Carolyn Hart and Linda Grant and I think Sharon McCrum also, although again, you know, my mind is not reliable on this, uh, created the Books in Print project, which I think to this day, I think it's the most brilliant thing that sisters did in those early days. We created a list of everything that, that first we started with our members, but we expanded it to any woman who wanted to be part of it. So we had, we were taking this to libraries and, and to booksellers, and then we just started hearing anecdotally from from readers saying, you know, I'd given up on this genre after I outgrew Nancy Drew because I wasn't seeing myself in anything I was reading. And so my opinion, but I believe that sisters really single-handedly or multi-handedly, but as an organization, grew the mystery for the publishing industry. Because although there were quite a few men who were very, and some women too, who, who were really a, just viscerally anti-sisters, uh, and uh, you know we got attacked in so many fanzines from that era, uh, and the claims that we were advocating censorship. We wanted to get men's books out of the stores and into Lake Michigan or wherever they were, but really what we did was increase readership across the genre. And I, you see that still today in the bestseller lists that the first, well, the 15 slots at the Times lists, I bet at least half and probably 70% of them in any given week are, are crime novels or thrillers, something in, in our genre. So in the 1970s and 80s, women formed groups in many fields for support and for advocacy for changes. Did you and others see sisters as part of that movement? I think that I, it's a very good question and, it, and it's not one that I have a good easy memory of, but I had been a graduate student in history at the University of Chicago in the uh, late 60s and early 70s. And we certainly needed a women's organization there. That We had no women on the faculty. Uh, we had one woman on the faculty. Out of, it was out of 60 faculty members. Oh. Um, and we, you know, we, we, it was the same story that women were getting everywhere. One of my sisters-in-law was applying for medical school and kept being told they already had their woman student. So, uh, and this was the era in which a group of women sued Harvard Business School to, so that they were forced to start admitting women. This was the era when Ruth Bader Ginsburg, probably a little bit later, since she's older than she's a generation ahead of me, but half a generation. But w the fight that she had to undergo. So I think we were all very aware, even if we weren't participating or it was really on the radar of the times. And of course it was a time of organization and protest and um, we all had, had grown up with the civil rights movement coming into full flower and the anti-war movement and then uh, when Stokely Carmichael said that the proper position for women in the movement was prone, well, I thought, please, I hope you really meant supine. Um, but it, we were really ready to to start going back to 1848, the um, Seneca Falls Convention, and start really advocating once again for women's voices. 
Can you talk about the review project, where members around the country counted the numbers of reviews that men and women crime writers received in various publications? I don't remember getting much response from publishers. I know one woman on the, uh, in the early part of the organization, and I only know this anecdotally, so I'm not going to give you her name, but she said that someone called and told her she would never be published again if she took an active role in Sisters. I don't know if that's true or false, but um, publishers, by and large, weren't paying much attention to us. And then um, Marilyn Stasio did a big story in the New York Times on women crime writers, and suddenly it was like there was a recognition that we were a hot topic. And so publishers started actively then seeking more women writing about women characters, I mean, active women characters. And, and so that, um, that sparked, I think, a certain amount of, of um, more enthusiasm for what a lot of, the, lot of women writers were doing. And then, of course, men wanted to, to be part of it. And that caused a lot of headaches. In the end, of course, it's obvious that we, we did agree that men could be members. Um, by then, I wasn't really taking such an active role in the organization. So a lot of, a lot of stuff after 89, 90, I don't really know that much about. But I do know that there were that there were quite a few women who who did not want male members. They felt it would end up being like so many other women's organizations that if men came in, it would be men's voices and women's voices would no longer be heard. Well, that obviously hasn't happened. It's still very much an advocacy group about women. Could you talk about the structure of the organization and how it evolved? Sisters is an organization with a mission and maybe we floundered for a while in the 90s and didn't have a good focus on what our mission was or or what we wanted to be doing as an organization but but uh, I think it's great when I went to the to the annual meeting in um, New Orleans last October, I came away just blown away by what Sisters was was doing and advocating for uh, writers of color and for libraries and for um, for LGBT writers and and so on. And I just um, it really made me. I had two feelings. One was enormous pride that I'd been like the yeast that made this bread grow and the other was I never I never would have dreamed it would be like this and I couldn't run the organization in, as it is today. I think it's amazing what the steering committee does. As a historian, how would you frame the overall development of Sisters in Crime? And are there any aspects that you worry will be forgotten or written out of history? I think there's always a danger with anything that women do that it will be forgotten and written out of history. There's a documentary filmmaker named Pamela Beer Briggs who created a small but beautifully done little documentary called Women of Mystery. She was trying to document on film, not on video. And this was pre-digital media. The careers of, of a number of women crime writers, including me and Grafton and Marsha Muller, but she had a much bigger, more ambitious um, project in mind, but she, over a 10-year period, couldn't get funding for it. I mean, she wanted to cover Linda Barnes, who was an instrumental early feminist writer, and Eleanor Taylor Bland of Blessed Memory. and. Um, and also to give a deeper historical context with people like Carolyn Heilbrunn, Amanda, Amanda Cross's uh, real name, birth name. Uh, over a 10-year period of fundraising and just w donating her entire inheritance from her grandmother to the project and being told over and over again 
by humanities councils that too much attention had been paid to women and it was time to step back from that. She finally decided to just do the, the film about Sue and me and Marsha. And, um, and it was frustrating, but also, you know, it's like, I, my, the example I keep turning to is Anna Catherine Green, who was the most widely read crime thriller writer of the last part of the 19th century. She was a model that, uh, that Conan Doyle turned to when he was creating Sherlock Holmes, not just for the structure of her books, but for the structure of her marketing expertise. Nobody knows her name today except for a few diehard, embittered women like me who are pissed off that, that she's disappeared from the record. So I think it's always, it's always a, a worry that, that women's achievements will, will vanish like smoke. There are days when I think, you know, 100 years from now, it'll only be one graduate st student in a tiny cubicle who will ever have heard of me. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, all you can do is keep being a voice, keep on trucking, and it's really impossible to know what, what the future will, will bring as far as this goes. I think Sisters, like many organizations, ebbs and flows in, in what it does and how it does it. I think when about 15 years into the organization, membership was at a low ebb and there just wasn't a lot of enthusiasm. And I suggested that it was time to disband. I said, maybe we've done everything we can do. And if there's no energy or interest in continuing, then let's draw a line and move on. And I think actually that shocked the board then into thinking maybe, maybe it was time to rethink the mission. And Sisters is now more vibrant than it ever was. So it obviously was a great idea that nobody took my advice. <laughs> Are there any other issues that you think Sisters in Crime should be addressing now? I think that um, the whole issue of women's voices is one that every f decade or so, just when I think that we're all going along okay, I realize that we're not. Um, that, in, for instance, uh, just last week in the um, Uber board meeting where one of the board members made a derogatory remark about women talking too much when Ariana Huffington was speaking, or when women senators are being forced to shut up for speaking, for asking questions during their allotted time in the Senate. It's obvious that as a society, we still are very threatened by women's voices. And in fact, there's actual research shows that if women speak more than 30% of the time, whether it's in a social setting or in a business meeting, the group comes together to shut them up and shut them out. And what sisters can do about that, I don't know. But one of my fears for sisters as an organization is that as an organization itself, it will be considered more and more marginal because it is women's voices that we don't want to attend to. One of the great takeaways from um, Long Beach, when the, the male, what was it, the men's? Men of Mystery. Men of Mystery was how many people of, of both sexes or all sexes and sexual orientations and race and so on came together to advocate for for open voices not men's voices uh, that was that was heartening that was reassuring but but I always fear that women's organizations are just over here behind the wall separating the women from the main business of the society. So I say stay fierce.
Revolution now. Quitters never win. Winners never quit. <laughs> and those are lines we'll see in the next V.I. Warshawski double, <laughs> right. aren't they? What impact has the organization had on you personally? Uh, I look at it as I look at a lot of things in my past with a certain amount of bemusement because I think I did this thing. I went home from the uh, Hunter College Conference. I did this thing. I organized people. I got them to organize and not agonize, but I still feel like a kind of a Clouseau-like kind of bumbling figure. So it hasn't had as much impact on me as it should have. It should have made me feel significantly empowered in a way that, that I'm still scratching my head over. Is there a particularly fun or surprising moment that you remember? Oh, I just think all of those early meetings, there was just so much energy and so much excitement. I can't point to one particular uh, moment, but um, just to be part of a group of people who were, who were sure that we could make change, and we did make change. I mean, I think despite the many arenas where more change would be desirable. We really did transform the, the face of, of the mystery publishing industry, and um, that's no small feat.